Welcome to the 2021 UK and Ireland winter weather outlook. Uh, I'm Peter McAward, the senior meteorologist at DTN, and uh, let's get started here. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes uh, off the bat. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. A uh, link will be shared afterwards. Uh, you should get that email to you. Uh, but please contact the host if you're experiencing any difficulties with the chat feature. Uh, we've got some time at the end for some questions, uh, but if uh, anything's pressing, you feel like you might forget it, just type it into the chat and uh, we'll try to get to those through the presentation. Uh, for the agenda today, we're going to be looking at the uh, the World Climate Service uh, forecast methodology here really quick to start off. Uh, then we'll have a look at the recent weather and trends review from past uh, winter and summer this year our uh, forecast techniques and guidance for the uh, the DTN winter outlook for 2021. Uh, there'll be a quick live poll and then uh, some interesting specific insights followed by the Q&A. So uh, first up here, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Jan Dutton, the CEO at uh, Prescient Weather to talk about the, uh, the World Climate Service forecast methodology. Thanks, Peter, I uh, appreciate that. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending the, the webinar today. Um, so for those of you that don't know, the DTN and the World Climate Service have a, a partnership together to uh, to prepare the long range forecast information that we're talking about today. And so the World Climate Service is an online tool set that enables improved long range forecast uh, processes. And our goal is really to try to provide the best long range forecast information available. Product itself has been available for 17 years, uh, and we've been working to improve the information and the methodologies in the product uh, over that entire uh, time frame. And really, the the core of the product is made up of providing seasonal information, so months uh, forecast for months in advance, and subseasonal information forecast for weeks in advance, using three primary methods. One is the dynamical forecast models. Uh, which is think of it as the, the weather forecast models that uh, that are widely used and widely known analog analysis uh, which is looking at um, time periods in the past that were similar to what is occurring today and then based on how uh, the past conditions evolved uh, we have some information about how today's conditions are likely to evolve and then as well statistical forecasts uh, so the, the easiest statistical forecast, and in fact, we'll talk about it a little bit today, is, for instance, the impact of La Nina on climate uh, around the world. Um, and so the idea then is that we have these three in independent methods that allow us to combine the information to come up with the best possible uh, long range forecast. So that's that's the core of the World Climate Service, and it's the the uh, it's the capability that that is powering the, the forecast that we're talking about today. And in fact, Peter will will talk about it a little bit more as he introduces the, the forecast. Peter, go ahead. All right, thanks for that, Jan. Uh, yeah, going into the uh, 2021 weather recap and forecast, uh, got a, a just brief uh, overview here. Going to be looking at the uh, the recent weather trends uh, from basically the past year. Uh, very brief look at last winter and then uh, looking at what happened over the summer and some key autumn weather patterns to watch out for as we head into the winter. Uh, and I'll go through kind of how we've uh, built the forecast for this year, looking at uh, the climatology and just what is normal, uh, followed by some of the analog patterns that we expect to develop over the winter months and some of the computer model projections all provided by uh, WCS. Uh, following that, I'll go through the DTN outlook for the 2021-2022 uh, winter. Uh, this will mainly be focused on November to January. I'll have a brief uh, preliminary look at February, but it's still a bit early in the year to have uh, much more than low confidence in the February outlook at the moment. Uh, the main forecast issues, though, is a heads up. Uh, I'm expecting it to be colder than normal with a growing risk of some more extreme cold outbreaks. This is kind of similar to what we saw last year. Uh, precipitation uh, more likely to be a bit wintry when it does occur, uh, but it looks like it'll be a low wind production uh, winter again, similar to last year. So recap of uh, the previous winter, uh, the UK average temperature over the whole season, and this was uh, December, January and February was just below normal, uh, but 
uh, this was kind of hidden with two uh, very mild spells that bookended the winter season. So first half of December, second half of February were unusually warm, and it hides that uh, it was actually quite a cold winter overall. Uh, January especially was very cold uh, for the UK. And we had uh, our coldest February night since 1955 in Scotland. Uh, we got down to minus 23. Uh, there was also above average wintry precipitation in February. Uh, the overall rainfall for the season was, was below average, but when we did see precipitation, it tended to be wintry, especially in the east. Uh, for summer 2021, uh, looking at the kind of Met Office seasonal averages here, we've got uh, temperatures uh, above average generally across the country, a bit more so in Scotland, uh, but also a very dry summer for most of the country. Uh, the big exception is this uh, large blue area in the southeast. Uh, we had a few uh, low pressure systems that brought in some flash flooding events uh, to the southeast, especially in London. A uh, couple very heavy rain days, uh, which made the news in uh, July. And uh, this kind of uh, skewed things a little bit. Uh, so overall, the summer, even in the southeast, was uh, was a dry one. But we had a couple of very wet events that uh, have made it look like it was a bit wetter than it was. Uh, the temperature trends I've added in here on the right, which uh, show how the temperatures kind of progressed through the season. And you can see for the majority of the summer, the temperature was pretty close to normal, uh, but we had a uh, substantial heat wave in the second half of July and also a uh, kind of a warm to a hot spell for the first half of June, which uh, brought the average up a little bit. Uh, this was felt a bit more in the north in Scotland. Uh, but yeah, generally a uh, near to above average summer uh, dry and with uh, low wind production throughout. So going into the forecast process, uh, when we make our forecast here at DTN and take a look at the climatology and with a bit more of a focus on the uh, the most recent 10 year trends, but uh, we're looking at uh, the kind of temperature trends over the past 50 to uh, 40 years. Uh, this will uh, help us determine our uh, analogs for the year and uh, some of our statistical forecasts, which are generally deviations from the normal. Uh, this normal will be uh, looking at the uh, kind of 1990 to 2020 trends with uh, maybe a bit more of a focus on the most recent 10 years. Uh, after that, we'll take a look at some of the seasonal models uh, from the computer and see what they're going for and uh, use all these tools together to uh, combine into our final forecast. So first off, what's normal for the British weather uh, going into winter? So uh, we're generally in kind of a mostly an oceanic uh, climate zone. Uh, the Scottish Highlands get a bit more polar, uh, but most of the country very similar. It's not a not a large country, so it's not unusual that we'd have a just one climate zone. Uh, I've added in the uh, number of kind of air and ground frost days in this graph here through the year for Heathrow, which is one of the warmest spots in the country. Uh, and you can see through the winter months, uh, about half the month tends to see frosts. Uh, uh, ground frosts a bit more common than air frosts. Uh, generally, uh, England is uh, wettest in October. Scotland, Ireland, and Wales tend to be wettest in January, uh, but winter is the wettest time of year for uh, the entire UK. Uh, Ireland and Scotland get a bit more exposed to the polar maritime ass, uh, air mass, which is uh, cold and moist, but it's modified by the ocean temperatures, so it's a bit less cold than uh, the continental air mass, which does occasionally get into England uh, when we get an easterly wind. So uh, because of this, kind of East England, East Scotland tend to run a little bit cooler than Ireland does uh, through the winter months. Uh, we also tend to see a lot of winter storms uh, through the year, uh, counting the storms that uh, get named by the Met Office. Uh, we average about eight per year uh, since 2015. Uh, these aren't really good snow producers for lowland areas. They'll, they will bring in snow for the mountains quite regularly, but uh, generally these uh, storms come in with uh, some milder air uh, from the Atlantic, so it, it tends to be more of a rain event 
maybe some snow right at the start, but uh, we don't tend to see heavy snow accumulations with these. Uh, easterly winds uh, from the continental polar air mass tend to be the big snow producer for the UK. Uh, we get a uh, sort of a lake effect from the North Sea uh, or a sea effect, if you will. And uh, these can be very heavy as we saw with uh, the beast from the East a few years ago. Uh, polar lows do sometimes get in as well. Uh, these are low, uh, small scale, low pressure systems that form north of the uh, jet stream. And uh, these tend to bring in blizzard conditions when they do move in, but these are uh, much less frequent. Uh, we maybe only see one or possibly two per year on average. So now we'll look at the uh, global teleconnections and the, uh, the current state of kind of the large scale weather patterns across the globe. So sea surface temperatures are uh, one of the big indicators uh, that we look at. And uh, La Nina has kind of finally officially been declared. Uh, you can see it on this uh, large swath of uh, blue and dark blue uh, colors extending west from South America. Uh, this is the equatorial Pacific and uh, La Nina is when this is below average. Uh, we're also starting to see a more typical La Nina response across the Pacific where we, uh, we see these warm anomalies in the uh, central north and central south Pacific. You can see these uh, just south of Alaska and uh, to the east of New Zealand. Uh, the warm anomaly in the North Pacific has been present all year and it was present for uh, a good chunk of last year as well. Uh, and through the summer months, it did extend all the way to North America, which is a bit unusual in a La Nina pattern. Uh, we are starting to see things cool down there. Uh, so you can see in the Gulf of Alaska, it's a uh, nice dark blue color now, and we're starting to see the, uh, the colder water move along the west coast of North America. So this uh, teleconnection is called the Northeast Pacific Mode or the MPM. And it's been uh, negative for most of the year, which again is unusual for, uh, for La Nina, but it's trending a bit more, or excuse me, it's been positive and it's trending a bit more negative, uh, which is what we do tend to see uh, for La Nina. Also the uh, Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, uh, which is the AMO, uh, remains strongly positive and that's uh, warm waters in the North Atlantic. You can see pretty much the entire North Atlantic, except for a small area near uh, Canada, is above average, and that's been pretty consistent uh, all year. Uh, so looking a bit closer at La Nina, uh, we finally officially had it uh, declared in September. Uh, it made headlines, um, various websites that were officially in La Nina. Uh, we've been expecting this for pretty much the entire year. Uh, there was a brief period in early spring where it looked like it might not happen, but uh, the models have been leaning towards this for most of the year. Uh, we do expect it to strengthen over the next couple of months, and uh, it will likely peak sometime in the winter. Usually it's uh, around December, January. Occasionally it's a bit earlier than that, but uh, it looks like maybe a December, January peak this year is uh, a good call. Uh, should be a moderate to strong La Nina. Uh, there's a slight chance of a weak La Nina. I've, uh, loaded some of the model plots here, uh, and you can see a few of them are uh, keeping the uh, La Nina conditions fairly weak near this kind of thicker zero line. Uh, but a few of the models also bring it uh, down to uh, below minus one, maybe even below minus 1.5. Uh, I think that's a little bit more likely in this case. Uh, so uh, this should tend to dominate the pattern for the Pacific and into uh, North America as we go into the winter months, as it's quite a strong feature. Uh, for the North Pacific, uh, we have the uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation and the Northeast Pacific Mode to look at. Uh, things have been a bit unusual uh, with the um, NPM being positive uh, for most of the year. It was positive for a good chunk of last winter. Uh, the, uh, the PDO has been uh, strongly negative for most of the year with uh, a few uh, wobbles here and there. Uh, this will likely remain negative through La Nina. The PDO and La Nina are coupled, so uh, we will expect to see this remain negative, and we should see the MPM trend negative uh, over the next month or so, and that should also remain negative uh, through the rest of the winter. Uh, the MPM trend is very similar to what we saw back in 1962. 
uh, which was a uh, kind of a famously cold winter for the UK and uh, North Europe. A um, little bit of caution to be used there, though, is uh, this positive MPM signal with a La Nina has only happened about three times in the past 50 years. So there isn't a really robust statistical signal for it. Um, so it's maybe not a great plan to uh, completely base the forecast off what happened in 1962. Uh -huh. Looking at uh, a few teleconnections a little bit closer to home, uh, we've got the North Atlantic Oscillation, or the NAO, and the Arctic Oscillation, or the AO. Uh, the NAO is usually a pretty key driver for European weather patterns, and it's based off of pressure difference between uh, the North Atlantic and the more subtropical Atlantic. Uh, this will uh, typically vary quite a bit subseasonally, so uh, it's a little tricky to uh, come up with a, a seasonal average. Um, however, there are some pretty good signs this year that we may see a persistent negative phase this winter with maybe only brief uh, deviations to a more positive uh, NAO. Uh, in addition, the uh, Arctic Oscillation um, essentially measures the, uh, the waviness of the north, northern hemispheric patterns, and uh, low sea ice like we're seeing this year uh, tends to favor a negative phase of the AO. Uh, when we're in a negative phase, uh, we'll get Arctic air more likely to be displaced southwards as the northern hemispheric pattern is more wavy. Uh, so I've included a handy graphic uh, that kind of shows what we're generally expecting this year. It's uh, it's idealized uh, in this case, but uh, generally looking for some higher pressure in the poles and uh, lower pressure in North Africa into the Mediterranean. So wetter conditions down there, uh, but some cold Arctic air uh, getting into North Europe at times. And uh, this brings us to the polar vortex quite nicely. Uh, this is generally a closed circulation of winds uh, in the stratosphere uh, over the poles. There's one in the North Hemisphere, one in the South Hemisphere. Uh, this typically strengthens in the winter as the uh, temperatures drop, uh, and it uh, when it is nice and strong, it tends to keep the Arctic air kind of locked over the poles. Uh, however, it can be weakened, and this can lead to some disruptions to it, and the polar vortex can get displaced and bring some of that Arctic air into the mid-latitudes. So uh, this has happened a few times in recent years, and it tends to make the news a lot when it does. Uh, the uh, polar vortex is a, it's a big media buzzword. Uh, but generally what that means is we'll have to watch where the vortex displaces to, and that'll give us a good idea of where we might see some of this Arctic air moving. Uh, a great example of that is actually occurring today. Uh, we're seeing some Arctic air get into the UK on a uh, pretty chilly northerly wind. If anybody's been outside this morning, they'll maybe have felt it. Uh, this is from a, uh, a weakening of the polar vortex that we've seen over the last couple of days, or last uh, couple of weeks, rather. Uh, we do expect that the vortex will strengthen again uh, and kind of reform over the Arctic as we head into early November. Uh, but we have seen a kind of a displacement of the Arctic air this week. Uh, it's not terribly cold at the moment because it's Arctic is still in its kind of autumn phase and it hasn't quite cooled off yet. Um, the, uh, the best chance for some pretty extreme cold outbreaks like we saw last year will happen later in winter, uh, in January, February especially. Uh, after the Arctic has uh, built up a nice frigid air mass. Uh, so when we get these displacements early in the season, uh, they don't tend to be quite as extreme. So main driving factors uh, for this winter, strengthening La Nina, a uh, negative PDO and NPM developing. Uh, we've got a positive AMO phase, so nice warm waters in the Atlantic, and we're expecting a persistently negative NAO and uh, AO. So now we'll take a look at a few forecast analogs uh, that uh, we've created based on some of the teleconnections uh, through the winter. Now, there's dozens of these that we've made to help us with the forecast, but uh, I've just included three here uh, to kind of get a sense of what these look like. And these are generated through uh, WCS, as uh, Jan mentioned earlier. Uh, the first one looks at kind of a, a typical La Nina winter uh, that we might expect uh, for Europe, which shows some uh, blocking high pressure just to the west of Europe through the early winter. And then as we head into mid and late winter, uh, we get more of a low pressure trough across North Europe. So 
Uh, this is a, a bit of a warm, wet signal as we head into the late winter as these uh, westerlies tend to bring in that more subtropical uh, Atlantic air. Uh, the middle uh, line looking at the uh, effects of kind of a negative North Atlantic oscillation combined with La Nina uh, shows uh, a very strong signal for some polar blocking instead. Uh, which keeps low pressure to the south. Now, in this case, the low pressure is a bit overhead. Uh, so that would mean a, a wetter pattern for the UK, but this is also uh, a cold pattern for the UK as well. And then uh, on the final line here, looking at the uh, the negative uh, PDO, which is the warm water in the North Pacific, uh, and the quasi-biennial oscillation, which is another teleconnection that we look at. Uh, and this favors uh, initial blocking uh, near West Europe, but then shifting over North Europe and into East Europe as we head through the winter. So you can see there's a, a lot of signals here, and uh, it can be tricky to pick out which one is uh, is the most useful. Uh, I've got the temperatures included here, which also shows the uh, kind of wide range through the different analogs and also across the season. So La Nina starts out cold and then progresses uh, more mild as we get into the late winter, uh, whereas this uh, persistently negative NAO is uh, a pretty cold signal throughout the entire season. Uh, this is also backed up a bit by the uh, negative PDO and QBO as well. So looking uh, at the computer models now, this is uh, just running uh, various computer models uh, out into the, uh, the very long range. Uh, these uh, can be a pretty good tool, uh, but sometimes are uh, a little bit unsure of how to forecast things. Uh, again, there's several of these, but I've included two uh, just for uh, brevity's sake. And uh, I'm looking at the ECMWF and uh, CFS uh, models here. Uh, ECMWF uh, is forecasting through the November to January pattern a, a pretty typical La Nina scenario, as the La Nina strengthening that's tended to bias the model heavily in favor of that. So. Uh, you can see a nice strong signal for high pressure in yellow uh, in the North Atlantic. Uh, not a super compelling signal for temperature across Europe, uh, but with that high nearby, you can see low wind production uh, in Northwest Europe. Uh, this, it, the temperature uh, trends are likely indicative of the uh, kind of subseasonal variation that we tend to see in a La Nina winter. Uh, CFS, on the other hand, is uh, going with uh, high pressure uh, a bit closer to Europe, more over West Europe. Still a low wind pattern, but there's a bit more of a cold signal for uh, for the UK. So our temperature could be very sensitive to where exactly this, uh, this high pressure ends up. Uh, so the models have uh, are kind of biased in favor of a strong La Nina. This is uh, most evident in North America. Uh, I've included a graphic here of just a kind of a typical La Nina pattern that we see in North America. It's almost exactly what ECMWF is forecasting for this winter. Uh, this tends to help set things up across the Atlantic as we see this trough in uh, the eastern United States and Canada, which leads into a ridge across the uh, North Atlantic, which ECMWF is very keen on developing. Uh, all right, so moving into our seasonal forecast, uh, once we've kind of taken all of this information into account. Uh, I'm expecting a uh, kind of a cold, dry, and calm winter for the UK. Uh, a bit atypical for a uh, La Nina year, but uh, we do think the signal from the uh, negative NAO is pretty compelling. So we're leaning on that a bit more than what we tend to see in a standard La Nina, which is very similar to what happened last year as well. So this negative NAO should lead to some persistent blocking across North Europe, uh, which will mean the winds and precipitation are likely below average. However, uh, if we do get some precipitation, it will tend to be a bit more wintry. Uh, so I think wintry precipitation days uh, might be a bit above average from what we typically see in a winter, uh, even though it will be a bit drier than normal. Uh, with the uh, likely weak polar vortex uh, this year, there's an increasing risk of some cold outbreaks uh, from the Arctic air mass as we get a bit later into the winter. Uh, so especially January into February, uh, we could get some, uh, some very cold air similar to what happened last year. We might get lucky and it'll just stay in Russia 
or uh, move into Canada, but uh, it does tend to migrate around when it gets displaced. So uh, we'll likely see it at some point through the winter. Uh, across Europe, the best signals for cold are going to be in the west and northwest, uh, in the kind of green and orange area there. Uh, the wettest weather will tend to be in the south across the Mediterranean. I think it'll be more likely to be consistently wet in the southeast and uh, a bit more variable in the southwest. Uh, warm anomalies are really only evident for the southeast, uh, kind of the Balkan Peninsula and Turkey. Uh, the northeast likely to be a, a little bit more volatile, often wet and cold, uh, but maybe a bit more changeable uh, month to month. And just a quick look at February, uh, I've made a few analogs. Uh, I've added in uh, one here, which looks at uh, a La Nina with a negative NAO through the preceding November and January, which is what we expect to be the case this year. And uh, it continues the uh, the cold air in place pretty much across the entire continent uh, for February with this uh, strong signal for blocking high in Scandinavia extending into central Russia. Uh, this is a, a not an unusual feature for late winters. Russia starts to cool off significantly. High pressure is favored there. Uh, this is also a uh, likely easterly wind uh, for Europe, which is the source of all the cold air. So uh, I think it'll continue to be a cold, dry, and calm winter as we head into February with some occasional sub-seasonal deviations from that. Uh, and this will likely be linked to when the AO or NAO kind of deviates from being negative and briefly becomes positive for a week or two. Uh, this is a bit different than what the computer models are showing, which is for a more typical La Nina. So because of that, my confidence is about medium uh, for the, uh, the winter outlook dropping to low by February. Uh, I think there'll be some sub-seasonal variation, especially with the temperatures, but uh, I do have kind of medium to high confidence that it'll at least be below average uh, through the season. I have a, a bit lower confidence on precipitation as we may see some of the low pressure in the Mediterranean uh, get into uh, southern parts of the UK and bring a bit more rain at times. Uh, so sub-seasonal factors to consider for this, uh, this year is the polar vortex displacement events. Uh, these will lead to uh, the risks of extreme cold, but they're a bit difficult to forecast at range. Uh, we'll at best probably get two weeks lead time on these uh, when they do develop. So uh, it'll be something that we'll need to keep an eye on on a sub-seasonal basis. And uh, we may see temporary deviations to the NAO. Uh, this is, it's pretty likely that we'll see some. Uh, how frequent is a bit more difficult to determine, but uh, when these do develop, they'll be a bit less blocky and we might see a winter storm uh, or two uh, which again, this happened last February as well. We had a couple of named winter storms develop as the NAO briefly went positive. Uh, but uh, I think these will be infrequent and uh, kind of with large gaps between them. Uh, so that concludes the, uh, the outlook. So uh, please take part in a, a brief three question poll. So last about a minute uh, and then we'll follow up with some of the industry impacts. All right, so hopefully everyone's had time to answer the poll now. I'm going to hand things over to uh, Chris Rees for the industry impacts. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, and a big, big thanks from me as well for your registrations and the attendance today. Uh, my name is Chris Rees, and I'm partner and channel sales manager here at 
DTN in Europe. Uh, I have, have to say, having having attended and participated in many of these webinars and occasionally, you know, physical events, uh, based on conversations I've had with uh, with customers, this is one of the most keenly anticipated winter forecasts I, I can remember. So, uh, big thanks to Peter for a, a brilliantly communicated forecast there, and thanks. Thanks to Jan before him for uh, for the introduction and for for getting up so early to uh, to support us in the webinar. So, familiar familiar agenda. We'll uh, we'll go through key messages and impacts. Um, we'll have a brief look at uh, DTN solutions, uh, and then I'll be passing you on to Tony, who will focus on on transport after after this. Uh, I mean, the, the current market conditions uh, around fuel, energy supply, labour, et cetera, they present some challenges heading into, into winter. And no doubt whether we'll have its say on how UK utilities balance and operate and manage their resources between between now and spring. So, you know, let's, let's just refresh on the key messages from Peter, uh, which if they realise, I guess, will lead to to some significant impacts on on water and gas utilities here in the in the UK this winter. Um, so you know below average temperatures across the season, and and this is driven by a predominance of high pressure promoting an easterly or northeasterly flow at least some of the time. Uh, a high frost count is likely, and al although a drier than average season is expected, uh, as Peter said, the risk of of snow and ice is elevated uh, due to the forecast forecast temperatures. There will likely be periods of fog and low cloud, particularly inland, and again, a symptom of, of cold, calm conditions in the UK during winter time. And then uh, both wind and, and precipitation are expected to be below average this winter, uh, at least through, through December and January. So let's quickly translate those to Anticipated well, those anticipated features of, of the winter weather into impacts. So top top of the pile, I guess, has to be the potential for a high or higher than normal demand on, on household heating. You know, in the context of the current situation and the high wholesale price of energy, uh, this has to uh, has to have our attention. Um, you know, accurately predicting people's behaviour when it's cold, um, but energy prices are high. Um, will be important. We think we think this season, and of course, there's a there's a more physical impact cold weather brings. Freeze thaw processes and activity above and below the surface, they'll have an impact on on assets and a resource impact on our utility companies as they uh, as they work to maintain their network. So, you know, whenever temperatures are low, there's an increased risk of line icing events affecting our power utilities. Um, but as Peter said, you know, sufficient wind and moisture to trigger this this particular phenomenon may not show at least till the back end of the season. Um, and confidence in the overall pattern at that stage is is, is currently low. Um, and then we have the impacts on on meeting demand and balancing the grid based on a lack of renewal renewable energy supply. You know, I'm I'm going to leave the scenario planning to the to the experts, to the energy analysts and, and the modelers, but we do expect solar output and wind production to aggregate below normal winter levels. And, and lastly, you know, our water utilities on the supply side at least should have, have a keen eye on storage levels as the season develops. It is, it is expected to, to be a drier than average season. Okay, so for those of you who, who tuned into our summer forecast webinar in May, uh, I guess you'll recognise these last two slides, but it, it's about it's about what DTN can do to support its customers uh, as we move move into winter and work through it. And uh, as as Peter mentioned, it's it's going to be critical to stay up to date on the week to week variation this winter. Uh, it's not likely to stay cold and dry throughout, and as such, um, you know Peter and his team. And, and with collaboration with Jan and his team, you know, we produce a sub-seasonal forecast report twice each week, which breaks down the coming 
six weeks and offers enough detail to support some, some key decisions. Um, and I guess looking at this slide, the, the key are the, the, the key points are we, we break down the forecast week by week, trying to provide that that detail with delayed decisions. You now we look at what the trend is in the forecast. We look for key changes since since the previous forecast. So you can get an idea of confidence levels in, in that respect. And we put a lot of emphasis on, on the confidence that we have in the forecast. So we try and spell that, that confidence level out for, for customers. Um, and then we, we, we try and identify the key risk factors. So, you know, if, if the forecast we're going for is not the one that, uh, that, uh, that actually realizes, you know, what's the most likely uh, secondary forecast, if you like. And then we and then we're just looking to break the UK forecast down for for you guys in in terms of regions, and and key parameters that are going to affect your decision making. And then, you know, DTN has a, an abundance of, of tooling, I guess, and a around the clock weather room, of course, to make make sure customers are fully briefed on on adverse weather and have the capability to monitor the weather conditions in in real time and. And Weather Sentry is an example of how you know, we, we try to put our intelligence and insights into, onto the desks and into the hands of our customers uh, through state-of-the-art mobile and, and app technology. Um, so the full two-week-ahead forecast is available to you on, you know, on your mobile, on, on your laptop, um, on your phone, um, and you can set up alerts around your working, your operational thresholds, and you can talk to our experts at any time via chat functions or, or via telephone consultancy setups. So it was brief, but I hope it was it was useful. Um, and I look forward to some Q and A later. But uh, right now, I'll hand over to to Tony as a focus on transport this winter. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, and thank you for, to all the uh, previous presenters. It, it's been very insightful in, in what we're expecting. V very similar to Chris, look, look, who, who looked at the energy industry. I'm going to try and look at the key messages I believe that that, that we can take from the very insightful uh, information that Peter has supplied this morning in terms of the impacts for transport over, over the coming winter, how they might provide operational challenges um, for, for those people that have to deliver the winter service to maintain, maintain the open network, and how DTN can support that um, with it, our features uh, and products. Thanks, Chris. So what were the key messages? Um, well, if, if we look at what Peter was certainly discussing, um, and we look, as was mentioned, at similarities with previous winters, which is one of the key factors when a lot of the events line up in a very similar way, there are three um, key, key years that, uh, of recent years, that, that one could look at. Um, 2013, uh, 2020, just last year, and 2010. Um, and most people who were in the industry around 2010 will remember the events of 2010. They were very similar. Uh, we had a kind of warm winter going up. It, we then had some very sharp cold spells just after Christmas into January, which saw the industry put under quite an immense strain when it came to salt and the procurement and restocking of salt levels. So all those have got to be borne in mind. And each, each of those years that have been quoted as similar events are all below average cold winters. So um, we're pretty confident at DTN that we are going to have an average cold winter. And that's something that will have its own bearing. Any snow events that, that have been mentioned as we see these changes are likely after December. Um, they could be prolonged uh, for over a week at time. 
There may be some respite uh, within frequent warmer, windier weather in between, but that will also bring its challenges with things like flooding, thawing, um, if, if we do have some snow events. Thanks, Chris. So, what are the impacts? Certainly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, certainly in 2010, there was a, an impact on salt uh, and the restocking of salt over a, a winter season, particularly after Christmas. So that is something that uh, people should bear in mind that um, they have levels of salt uh, and resilience from the start. There are some other things that, that certainly have, have been more recently, certainly discussed in, in things like the press. There's a nationally reported lack of drivers. Whilst that might not be a huge concern for operators, i.e. gritter drivers, that may have some impact on key suppliers, such as salt suppliers and fuel suppliers, when it comes to restocking of, of key, key requirements and resources. Cold spells and prolonged cold spells often bring challenges on drivers and driver's hours management. And this, under those events, and certainly with the addition of snow, will bring its own challenges to, to operators. Snow and severe weather um, often require planning of additional resources, uh, not necessarily key resources, but additional resources to support the main frontline uh, resources that are being used, such as additional snow plowers, snow blowers, uh, and the additional operatives used in, in such snow events. So again, um, keeping an eye on the requirement of that, certainly January, February, I think may well actually be key. I, I have made reference to the fuel, recent fuel shortage, and if it was to prolong or, or, or to deteriorate, certainly as we head towards the cold weather, that may also become its own issue that um, we may have issues with actual fuel supplies for the equipment that we need to deliver the service here on the network. Thanks, Chris. How can we support you? Well, as, as, as users know, we do have Roadmaster. It is a, a very versatile tool, provides them with a lot of data, uh, graphs, details of forecast, up to Dever, uh, up to the day observation, and even such as live radar. Um, we do have the app. Many of you are users of the app. and anyone with access to the website can obtain access to the mobile app by downloading it from their app store and using the same user and password details to enter it so they have a mobile app with all the details on. Thank Chris. So I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank everybody um, and I will now pass you to David. Cheers, Tony. Thanks. G'day, everyone. Uh, my name's Dave Berry. I'm the Aviation Solutions Engineer at DTN. Sorry about the technical issues. Um, so let's have a chat about the uh, aviation possible impacts to this winter. So from an aviation perspective, uh, we're going to cover the key messages that apply to the aviation industry. Uh, we'll look at some historical case studies. And the reason why I want to do that um, uh, is to highlight the, the possible impact that it had to the industry and uh, use that as a comparison for reference, especially in the previous years. Uh, then we'll look at the general operational impacts. And I do mean general uh, or the business challenges that we could possibly face, especially at the end of winter and uh, give a so what factor. And uh, finally, quickly touch uh, on some of the solutions that DTN can bring to uh, your operation to help mitigate that weather risk. Thanks, Chris. So um, thankfully, from an aviation point of view, uh, the impacts of the weather at the start of winter will appear to be relatively benign, uh, with those more extreme events possibly happening uh, towards the end of winter, especially if we start to see that odd winter storm uh, in the new year. Um, my, main con my main caution, I guess, is, um, is around the blocking that Peter has mentioned. Um, and this may mean that 
we might see some days, especially around those colder days of the high pressure over the region, um, we will see possibly significant periods of fog and low stratus, and this could result in some uh, ATM issues at our, uh, at our airports. Um, and, and my concern around that is that, you know, it's going to affect the capacity demand stability. Uh, next slide, please, mate. So outside those reduced visibility conditions, um, it is the uncertainty that is growing throwing some caution in the air, I guess. And for that reason, um, you know, I, I, we do need to look at some of those analog years to identify um, similar trends um, if they do occur. One such year that we have been looking at is indeed last year in 2020. In particular, looking at the weather that occurred in late February and what happened with Storm Chiara and Dennis. Um, both of these storms produced um, extreme crosswinds across our airports and led to frankly, widespread network disruptions. And uh, in particular, um, you know, Storm Dennis did bring a lot of heavy rain um, uh, and a lot of warnings, like a few hundred warnings. Um, but as an aside, we did see some uh, very strong jet streams across the Atlantic, uh, making for some very fast uh, transatlantic runs um, or flight times. Thanks, mate. But when looking, but when we're looking at the start of winter um, season, you know, we'll see our highest confidence is on the temperatures. So, okay, snow is not a uh, particularly high risk um, with that dry weather expected. Um, however, um, one of the years that we have been looking at is 2010, and that year did bring um, significant snowfall um, and aviation disruptions across the UK and Ireland. Um, especially at our major hubs, um, hub and spoke ports, particularly um, Gatwick and um, Heathrow, for instance. Um, but look, just want to flag that up as a, as a possible caution. Um, it, it did cause uh, significant disruptions. Next slide, please, mate. So I just wanted to briefly touch upon some of the operational impacts from late winter last year again. Um, obviously one of the concerns had been flooding also across uh, parts of the UK. Um, this would have meant various contingency plans and disruption planning activities would have taken place. Um, these events uh, not just would have affected the airports but also the local environment. And I think we must also, not only when I say the local environment, um, the TMA and the FIR, but also, you know, the actual transportation networks going into the airport um, is something we need to consider as well. Um, again, I want to go back to quickly reiterate uh, the risk of IFR conditions that are likely under those blocking scenarios, especially with high pressure to the north of the UK and Ireland and um, the possibility of significant periods of reduced visibility and low cloud. Thanks, Chris. Um, Again, I know we're not expecting um, strong winds, but if we do have those storms like uh, Chiara and uh, Dennis, um, we know the disruptions in the industry that was caused by these events, especially with strong wind shear um, across many of our uh, major hub and, um, and secondary hub, uh, sorry, ports. Thanks, mate. So to round up my section, I just wanted to quickly uh, mention another one of our um, solutions, and that's our Met Console Aviation Suite. Uh, Met Console is a, well, frankly, a state-of-the-art solution that essentially is a data integration engine. Um, it effectively fuses and presents in a highly customizable um, user interface elements such as, you know, AWOS, ATIS, LOWOS, um, RVR solutions. It's uh, totally sensor agnostic, uh, meaning you can integrate your, your current um, sensors. Um, it doesn't have to be um, aligned with uh, a certain company or whatever. Uh, next, please. Um, and here are some of our examples of other uh, sources of data and services that uh, can be incorporated into Met Console. You know, take, for instance, Aviation Century that uh, Chris was talking. We can put in um, uh, Roadmaster or, or, or the aviation equivalent, uh, Runway Master, Ice Guard, et cetera, uh, Nav aids. Radar, um, and um, it, is, it also helps with unmanned uh, tower operations as well. So, um, look, uh, thank you. Um, uh, appreciate your time, and uh, with that, I'll I'll hand well back to Chris. <laughs> thank you very much, mate. Thanks, Dave. Um, okay, 
So we've wrapped up the uh, the industry insights, and we'll we'll move quickly on to to Q and A. I think um, there's five minutes or, or so left in the, in the webinar, but uh, often we spill over, and everyone's going to have a uh, a recording of uh, of this session if they can't hang on till till the very end. Um, so a number of questions have come in. Uh, it makes sense, I think, Dave. If I start with one that appears to be pointed at you. Um, how significant to aviation and how widespread could low cloud be this winter? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Yep. Um, well, uh, you know, I think if we take, um, I think if we take, you know, the, the, some of the big impacts out, yeah, I think if we do get those scenario that, you know, we see some high, high pressure dominate over the UK, um, you know, and, and obviously we've, we've got a reasonably good high confidence of that colder, low temperatures. Um, you know, I think we could see one of those years that low stratus and fog, I think are quite a big deal for aviation. Um, I think we'll see some frequent IFR days, um, one of those winters that possibly, you know, could see, uh, you know, ceilings around a thousand feet. Um, I think one of the, one of the impacts from that will be carriage of extra fuel, um, selection of alternates. Um, you know, the beauty about the UK is that we do have a lot of a plethora of, of suitable alternates for wide body and narrow, well, especially wide body aircraft. Um, you know, when one part of the UK could be um, affected, you know, I'm thinking, with, you know, at the south, Heathrow, Gatwick, etc. You know, we've got uh, a variety of of, of mainland UK airports up to the north, say Presswick, etc. That could be still available. You know, that, yeah. So I think it could be significant if it does occur. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, and Tony, uh, one for you, if if I may. The um, you mentioned similarities of the long range forecast and salt shortages in 2010. Do you think this will occur again this year? Uh, I guess. Um, oh. As one of the results of the out uh, um, 2010 and, and then the following season 2011, the government undertook a white paper to look at salt, salt procurement and resilience to local authorities. Now that was brought into place in terms of increasing stock levels, both at salt suppliers and at each of the authorities having a, a, a greater resilience level that, that, than they had in 2010. And it has been tested uh, every year since then, including last year, which was also mentioned as a reasonably similar year. So, so no, um, the only caveat that I would possibly put that on uh, with that is obviously, as I mentioned, um, the shortage of drivers and potentially if there was issues with fuel and fuel supply. Okay. Thank you, Tony. And, and Peter, uh, how aligned are you with the UK Met Office on this, this forecast? Can we expect big headlines as the press overreact or misinterpret? professional opinion this winter? Uh, yeah, I, we're fairly aligned at the moment on the temperature, um, both expecting a, a cooler uh, winter, and that should begin to rear its head in uh, November. So um, the uh, kind of latest uh, Met Office forecast uh, goes through kind of October, November, December. Uh, they should be issuing their update uh, shortly for uh, November December, January, but I'm anticipating a uh, cold and they're also looking at an increasingly dry winter, um, at least for the November, December timeframe with more blocking. So, uh, yeah, we're both in agreement, which is always nice. Um, and yes. likely a, uh, uh, cold headlines will start appearing on some of the, uh, some of the websites. Uh, I, I can also see a question, uh, on the uh, likelihood of a beast from the east type event yeah. um, occurring this winter, and uh, similar to the uh, the namesake, um, which was uh, back in 2018, uh, these events with uh, heavy snow and the biggest impacts are more likely later in winter. 
um, similar to the uh, Arctic temperatures, we have to wait for the cold air to really build up in Russia uh, before an easterly will bring a heavy snow event. Uh, with the uh, the blocked pattern and the uh, high pressure generally kind of in North Europe or to our north, uh, that does promote easterly winds. And uh, the February analogs that I've made so far uh, suggest a, a higher likelihood for some easterly winds uh, as we go into kind of January, February. So um, it's definitely in the cards this year. A uh, bit too early to tell if it's going to be quite as extreme as uh, the one we had in 2018. But uh, we did have a uh, a, a kind of a less intense beast from the east uh, last year in uh, early February, I believe, uh, which did see some heavy snow in uh, East Anglia. So, um, yeah, d definitely in the cards this year. Uh, I think the likelihood of something like that with a easterly bringing in some snow is uh, moderate to high as we go into uh, February. Got it. Thanks, Peter. And Jan, uh, question here. You, you mentioned model calibration in your introduction. Um, why is model calibration important? Chris, uh, that's 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 a great question. So, model calibration um, is a process by which we basically uh, statistically correct the, the the forecast models. And so, in the so Peter mentioned, for instance, the ECMWF and and the CFS models. So it turns out that in addition to the real time forecasts that update uh, in the case of the seasonal forecasts every week, or sorry, every month. And in the case of sub-seasonal, uh, the ECMWF updates twice per week and the CFS is every day. Um, we also have access to very long histories that are called re-forecasts. And so they, they are literally uh, forecasts of the same time period, but uh, run over the prior, say, 20 years. And so a calibration process compares the weather conditions that actually happened to the re-forecast data. And it allows us to make corrections to, to systematic errors and most importantly to the probabilities or the uncertainty of the forecast. And so the reason calibration is important is because we are able to produce uh, what in the science is called reliable probability forecasts, which means that, for example, if we forecast warmer than normal conditions with a 60% probability, it should occur 60% of the time. And so the forecast process uh, is is aided by that because a forecaster, in this case Peter, uh, gets um, knows that the probabilities are reliable, and then can use the analog information and the statistical information to try to hone in a little bit more on on, on the forecast. And so um, what is also interesting then is, for instance, uh, in our research, we've shown that, for example, the ECMWF model in uncorrected format or, or unpost processed tends to be overconfident. So it'll forecast warmer than normal with say 60% probability and it doesn't, it happens basically 30% of the time. Uh, so the, the calibration adds substantial value to the, to the actual forecast. Okay, thank you, Jan. And I know you're, you're always on hand to our, our customers and prospects to, to go through that. Absolutely. Quite technical information in a, in a little bit more detail. Great. Okay, uh, Peter, the, the summer forecast that you you reviewed it briefly and you mentioned you you showed the split in uh, precipitation between southeast England at least and and the rest of the country. Do, are, are there any similar regional differences expected this winter in terms of of wind or precipitation? Uh, it's. A little bit um, difficult to pin that down at the moment. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, if we get something like a beast from the east, uh, the eastern half of the country could be significantly wetter than the western half. Um, and like we saw in the summertime, even one or two extreme events can tweak the average for the whole season. Um, I think in general, the, the entire country will be uh, a bit drier than normal. There's a slightly increased chance for some uh, more frequent wet spells in the south and southwest, which is kind of shown on the on the map here on the display. Uh, Cornwall and Devon are in that green color. 
I, I still expect it'll be drier than normal even down there, but uh, they'll have a greater likelihood to be a little more wet than the rest of the country. So uh, yeah, we could see a, a slight wet signal in the Southwest. I think we have, we have one more and it looks like it's pointing to you, uh, Dave. You showed the Met console um, product. Um, are there any specific features in that that address runway flooding? Uh, oh, thanks. Yep. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, yes, actually, no. So we've got a, uh, one of the products, one of the solutions within that is our, um, water film depth, um, solution, the algorithm, uh, uh, it's fully GRF compliant. So ground reporting format, IKO GRF, uh, compliant. Um, it allows for, um, a calculation. Uh, to be made across the entire runway of, of you know, for, for breaking action, that, for, sorry, that feeds into the breaking action reports. Um, no need for pavement and ground pavement sensors. It's just basically, a, it, it's calculated um, quite cleverly actually on a, using a, a series of, of, um, of measurements taken across, you know, from the, Touchdown zone through through the end of the runway, um, it's and it creates both basically a three D model. Um, uh, yeah, so it's a you can you can insert uh, you know radar into it. it, it it's um, yeah, it's a the it basically the algorithm warns ATC and pilots um, about the risk of of, air, of aircraft aquaplaning um, during that you know that critical phase of, of not only takeoff but also you know, obviously landing. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Well, I think we we wrap it up there. We've gone slightly over time. Just a, a another another thank you to everyone for registering and attending, and uh, you'll receive follow up via email, including a recording of this session and uh, some bonus uh, follow up material. Uh, we and uh, all the the various account managers who talk to you from. Uh, uh, on a regular basis, look forward to staying in close touch through this winter, which 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 could turn out to be uh, a busy one for us all. So thanks again, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you again soon.